Set on nearly 100 acres, the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum combines botanical gardens, a zoo, aquarium, and two miles of walking paths through desert landscape. While there, I joined up with Eric Rakestraw, the curator of botany, to take us through some of the most iconic plants of the desert landscape. My name is Eric Gregstraw and I'm the curator of botany and I oversee our plant collections and our gardens here on grounds. How large is the Sonoran Desert Museum? Uh, we have about 21 developed acres and about 100 acres off of that that we also maintain. All of it has to be kept up or maintained or watched. This is obviously a habitat I didn't grow up in. Is this one that you have grown up in or did you just grown to love it? I, I grew up in Southern California, so along the coast, but uh, when I was able to drive, I made inroads to the deserts in East County there, Anza Borrego Desert, Colorado Desert and whatnot. So I've always been kind of a desert rat at heart. <laughs> uh, started with snakes and then got into plants and uh, here I am today. Got yeah. it. I was a tree trimmer for many years, so I've always done some sort of horticulture. Well, we are staring right now at this uh, amazing agave. Do you want to take us through it? What makes this unique? So this is agave polona. Uh, and as you can see, I think what makes it most unique right now is this beautiful flower stock, spikette stock, uh, wine to cherry red flowers. Um, this is a strictly Sonoran species, very xeric habitats of Sonora and it prefers really rugged limestone outcropping. So, um, and I think the, that the red on the margins, rubyish red shading along the margins uh, is also very cool when it's you know, not in flower. Now, is this one of those plants where it flowers once and then it starts to die or? That's true, this is monocarpic. So it could be anywhere from, I'm not sure on this particular species, but anywhere from 10 to 20 years, you know. And this is just part of the reproduction progress uh, process. So it, you know, it gets all those sugars and starches ready, puts it into flower production to carry on the next generation. It was so funny because when I was in Huntington Botanic Gardens, I was driving, it was right before they were blooming, and I was like, that just looks like a huge asparagus. Yeah. But it's in the same family, right? It's asparagaceae? DA family, yes, yeah. absolutely. And then here's another one. Now, what's kind of peculiar about this is that you know how like aloes, they might bloom from the bottom up or whatever. This one looks like it's blooming in kind of weird ways. Yeah, this one, I, it started from the bottom and is working its way up. We have a smaller one around the corner here and it's doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah the, well, I, you know, the midsection looks like it's already done. Already done. Yeah, that's yeah, what I said. It's yeah. kind of strange. It's like kind of like belted or whatever. Yeah. And this one seems to be in more sunlight here, right? Because it, it's getting a little bit more sun on its leaves. A little more sun, but it is, I think that's just giving way, giving all them starches and sugars to the, to the flower there. And that's going to wither and die soon, so. Um, I just wanted to point out this other, this particular individual saguaro looks like it's, it's definitely bifurcated already. Yeah. And looks like it's trifurcating, if that's even a word but it, it may turn into a crustate form eventually. We just don't know yet. And well, it's not that bad. Just, Does it, all the others look like they're giving you the finger. Yeah. <laughs> a little more subtle. Uh, the reason for this is that the cells, for whatever reason, divide outward rather than radially. Hmm. And I don't think they're really, they're really why it does this. Some people have speculated that it could be uh, freezing temperatures, but if that was the case, why wouldn't you see it more in its cohort population? Uh, just don't know. So this is one of two that you have on two. site. It wasn't that long ago that the estimated population of crested saguaros was in the 200s, but in 2014, a couple of local fellas formed a crested saguaro society and they went around and started documenting and photographing all the individuals that they could find. And I think right now they're above 2000. I mean, it's kind of a thing. I mean, I think even back in the day, there was a book on monstrous and crustate. Yeah, succulents. and we have other cacti that are um, pretty much just always monstrous. Like there's a form of Sunita cactus that uh, from a couple, couple of populations in Baja that um, are monstrous. And um, all the ones that we have are from those populations. But 
they'll spend many years in that monstrous form, and as they age and get a little older, some of them kind of revert back to that, um, the more common form. Now, you had mentioned off camera before that this form doesn't always benefit them in the climate. Can you share why? No, you know, once you, uh, on this stem, the cylindrical stem, you're up there in elevation, you're standing in the environment, we have heavy winds and uh, monsoonal storms, you create that big fan shape that uh, makes this plant susceptible to wind throw right. and whatnot. It's like a giant catcher's mitt. <laughs> right. So I've seen quite a few of them fail. But yeah. that being said, I've seen some very, very old individuals. If they crop off though, they can still be alive, right? Absolutely. If the saguaro were to break midway down, its chances of survival are still uh, very good. It, it very often, depending on the niche environment that they are in, they can produce arms, an offset arm. So the Joshua tree Yucca brevifolia is, of course, best known as an indicator plant of the Mojave Desert. Um, in Arizona, along the 93 corridor, the two icons come together. You can see there uh, both saguaros and Joshua trees uh, sympatrically. It's an interesting mix of uh, plant palette there when you get those two together. So this is our little sliver of representation of the Joshua Tree Mojave Desert. It's thought that they evolved with giant ground sloths that would, the only thing that could reach the seed and spread it, other than maybe birds. But. So this is our local native species of Ocotillo, Fuquiaria splendens. It's ubiquitous here in the Arizona Upland subdivision. It also makes it into the grassland. It really likes limestone deposits as well. You often find this over limestone caves. It's a main pollinator plant for the hummingbird. They use this when they're heading north. So unscrupulous collection of ocotillo for sale in Texas and New Mexico can be problematic for that pollination. And I know it's a med medicine and medicinal purposes, but what else would they be collecting? What they're using it for here mostly is they end up at like garden centers and sold for living fences and or the plants themselves, but they come over on flatbed trucks. They're often ripped out of the grounds with chains. Mm. Um, and it's wholesale, you know, they don't take one or here. It's, it's just an unsustainable practice. Mm. And so you should probably never buy one unless it's from a reputable grower. And, and uh, folks now are, have learned to grow them from seed fairly quickly. This is probably a better jojoba, but this is definitely tapped into some water here. I'm sure this one is with the path side as well. but. This is, would be more typical as you would encounter them in the environment. One of their uh, strategies for living in the xeric landscape is that they angle their leaves up towards the sun so that only the sun hits the leaf edges. Right, and, and so as the, protected yeah. chlorophyll and water. Probably. Right, and as the sun sets or rises, the, the rest of the leaf surface will get light at that time and, and you know can produce photosynthesis. It's used heavily in the cosmetic trade and also is a good replacement for whale oil. Hmm. And people used, did people waxy. use whale oil for like uh, for light? And yeah, like back in the day. Or? But I think this has only come into play uh, in the last probably 40 years as a replacement for oil in industry. And a lot of that pro production, I believe, has moved to um, the Mid Middle East. Um, there are some old plantations west of Yuma or east of Yuma, but they seem to have gone fallow at this point. Probably easier to do overseas economically. It produces a very large fruit or nut. The Seri, indigenous folks along coastal Sonora considered it a famine food. You only ate it when very hungry. Uh, several species of mammals will consume the nut, but only the Baileys I think pocket mouse is the only one that can digest the waxy resin. If you eat too many, you probably wouldn't feel too good. One, one here or there is okay, and it's, uh, it's similar, has a kind of a coffee taste to it. <laughs> the other thing about the leaves on the jojoba is that the way the leaves are angled or situated, uh, this is a wind pollinated plant, and so when it's in flower and we get our spring winds, um, these leaves can kind of create a vortex. And the female flowers that hang below the leaf, that vortex will cause the male pollen to swirl all around them and become fertilized. 
Can you visually see the pollen? Is it no, oh, okay. no. And they say that this pollen is not uh, one of the problems with allergies, but okay. it's probably more of the ragweeds and ambrosia or ambrosia. Yeah. So. There's always one plant that gets the bad rap. Yeah. And, and in the Northeast, it's Soledago, and you're like, that's not even wind pollinated. Well, you, know, you know who gets it here is the palaveries. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Because that's what people, that's the most obvious thing yeah. when allergies are kicking off. And so we just naturally want to blame the Palo Verde, but it's a very sticky, heavy pollen. Yeah. And it's suited to, to insects and bee um, pollination. So it's not something that really becomes all that windborne. And even if it did, it's not going to be to the degree that it would cause upset with your sinuses. So, yeah, and there's generally more males than there are females. Oh, I think it's I a four to one. This just almost looks like a little acorn like with the top acorn, on, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the jojoba needs, a, I think, at least three inches of rain a year. And yet you don't really see them in the West Deserts. Um, so here is Nalina matapensis. Gosh, it looks like a and ponytail tree, palm. Tree bear grass. Tree bear grass. Yeah. Is it related to the ponytail palm at all? It kind of looks like that. It's a, it's a Nalina, so again, asparagaceae. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So if we were to move away all of these spent leaves, you'd see a rather large trunk in here. I feel like I'm looking under the hula skirt. Yep. I just think it's an amazing looking plant. It's kind of like the giant cousin it of the Sonoran Desert. Um, this occurs not in Arizona, but south of the border uh, in the Sierra Madre foothills up into the Oak Belt and a little bit down into the thorn scrub. It can branch. Actually, this one has multiple, is, is branching. You'll see several different heads if you look closely mm -hmm. here. So, And this will send up a big spike, sometimes eight to 10 feet tall, paniculate spike. So it's very beautiful. Um, just gets busy with pollinators. But it, to me, I just, it's just so unusual and strange. You know? And typically when they keep the plants that tend to keep their leaves retain that, and retain that like even like aloes or whatever, mm -hmm. it seems to be part of their protection. Yeah, probably from maybe fun, a sun exposure. Not sure. I have seen pack rats definitely de-skirt these. You mm -hmm. know, that's here on grounds where, you know, this is just the perfect environment for pack rats. But, you know, maybe uh, out in the in habitat, it might not be a case. Although I have seen in the field down in Mexico, these often get burned off with fires. Could be lightning strikes. So you will see the bare trunk and the branching. The look of this plant just speaks to the tropical or subtropical affinity of the Sonoran Desert, you know, because it is... When you see it, you, you kind of think palm, you kind of think tropics, right? Yeah, you do. I mean, it, d definitely. I mean, if I saw this and you didn't tell me anything and, and it was out of place, I would be like ponytail palm, something right, like that. Yeah. Right. But it's actually very, it's very much an inland uh, thorn scrub and oak woodland plant. Hmm. And it's not unusual to see palms in oak woodland environments south of the border. We'll see one of those as we go inside the aviary here. So this tree is Celtis reticulata, or canyon hackberry. It's in the cannabis family. Uh, it uh, often grows in higher elevations and drainages. Um, you don't typically see it here in the Sonoran Desert proper, but it does, like I say, occur in some of the lower drainages. Uh, but the really cool thing about this tree is this gnarly bark. It's really warty. <laughs> it is. It's like carbuncly, like, like you know, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. A, that's a good analogy, absolutely. I just think it's so interesting. Um, the flowers are insignificant, uh, the fruit is small, um, it's a favorite of birds and small mammals like Kawadi. Um, uh, Celtis occidentalis, ah. where we are, common hackberry, and it's a great wildlife plant. Yeah, absolutely. It has really interesting bark, but nothing like this barnacled nature of this. It, yeah. It's more like furrowed and rigid. Mm -hmm. It breaks easily. 
I don't know if uh, yours do does in wind. Dense hardwood. Okay. No, in, in fact, if you're trying to hike through this, it, it's <laughs> it's difficult. It's very rigid. It doesn't give. Now we have a uh, to the Arizona Upland subdivision of the of the Sonoran Desert, which this where this museum sits. Uh, the more common one would be Celtus pallida, and that's the desert hackberry, and it just becomes a large shrub. And again, very good for wildlife. It's great, great shade tree. It is. Is this some of the fruits on it? Or no? Yep. Yeah. So this is Bursera microphylla. Oh, Bursera. Yeah, so in the frankincense family. Um, these are not super common in the state. Um, there are isolated populations uh, just west of us here. Um, it's more common down in Mexico, um, and you'll find it in uh, some of the California, Colorado deserts, Anza Borrego Desert. Um, uh, what can I tell you about this? It's a stem succulent again, stores most of its resources in its trunk. Uh, they call it, common name is the elephant tree because if you if you look at this skin, this flesh, it, it's very pachyderm like. This is not a pachycol plant, though, right? Yeah, yeah, is it? absolutely. Okay. Could I guess you could call it caduceiform or pachycol? Okay. And you know, severe times of stress with little water, it can drop all of its leaves and survive just on the resources that it's stored in its tissues and trunk. And like a myrrh frankincense, does this still have a scent as well? Absolutely. Um, if you, yeah, very strong. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. Oh yeah. Isn't that nice? Ooh, that's nice. Yeah, very nice, very nice. Yeah. And these are often used to as specimen plants and containers. Um, you can prune these down to make little bonsai like yeah. uh, specimens so they're really neat yeah they make fun pets <laughs> this is Pasidia mollis it's in the fabiaceae family but the common name of this plant is fish kill tree or fish poison tree oh. so down in mexico um it's been said that they can use this they can crush up the leaves put in small bodies of water where there's fish and the fish will be stunned and therefore easily caught um the alkaloid is, uh, it's just a temporary stun and it's said that you can eat those fish afterwards. Hmm. But it's kind of neat, it has those kind of hirsute, silvery, reflective leaves. Um, you know, at first glance in habitat, if you were to see one of these, you might think, what is that, an oak tree? But, um, right. you know. It's kind of cool bark, you know, it's like very chalky. Very pallid. Yeah. yeah. This shrub here is Bonellia pungens, formerly, formerly Jaquinia pungens. It looks um, soft and subtle, but if you were to brush your hands up against these leaves, each leaf ends in a terminal spine, and it can be very... <laughs> it's not something you just reach into and prune. I mean, um, it's quite aggressive. So there's that terminal spine there, like a little needle. Yeah, look at it. And now Sari... Pernicious. Indigenous folks along coastal Sonora would use these leaves to decorate their hands. Gosh, it's like uh, more, it's like the New World form of, uh, what am I thinking of? The Chinese medicine. Oh, Help acupuncture. Me. Acupuncture, yeah. yeah. I've even seen people, you know, apply these to the face and line them down the nose, but. Um, <laughs> Probably not recommended in an aviary. <laughs> so, um, they get beautiful kind of rose-colored flowers. Um, the corollas stay um, formed even when they fall away. And uh, also the seri would also string those on necklaces. And you can reconstitute those flowers over and over and over again with water. Even after they've been off the plant for a very long time. And I believe it is said that the crushed leaves in a house will keep cockroaches away. <laughs> so I'm sure you're familiar with morning glory vine. Of course. Well, this is the morning glory tree. This is Ipomia arborescens. Again, another Sonoran species, grows in thorn scrub in the Sierra Madre. It's not in leaf right now. Not in leaf right now. I believe 
we have some others on grounds that are currently in flower, but this is a massive morning glory. It produces big white morning glory flowers. And if those stems were to make contact, say with another shrub or something, they will twine and twirl much like a vine. Really? Yes, absolutely. If you see the terminal ends of them, they become quite wandy. It kind of reminds me. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of like a really overgrown curcubid, you know, that gets the real uh, caudiciform, like a cucumber, like some yeah. of those desert cucumbers, and then they all start to twine. But this would be like a gigantic version of it. Yeah, Maura, I think, is our local cucurbit like that. And, well, um, cucurbit digitata is a vine that we have. But no, this, I think these are absolutely amazing. Keep tuned here on Plant One On Me because we have more great tours through Tucson, Arizona and beyond. Now, if you love what we produce, do us a favor and give the videos a like, subscribe, and hit the notifications button as your support matters. 1% of our Google AdSense revenue is also donated to plant conservation as well. And you can also find a suite of online houseplant and related courses on our website, homesteadbrooklyn.com, including the Houseplant Masterclass, an audiovisual course, and even our medicinal herbs flowchart. We'll see you in the next episode.